Good morning. Welcome to Lanier Point Church. We're so glad you're here. Will you stand up and worship with us? He's risen, amen? Amen? We're going to sing He's risen this morning. Risen, He's risen.
Sing along. For Jesus, the one who is alive, for love, he came for you and me. He died on that cross so that we could be free. That's why we're here this morning. Let's sing this, this old, old hymn together. It's so precious to me. It goes, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Shout praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Amen. He is alive. He is risen. He is risen. Let's do one more song.
was bound I saw the ground I was blind Couldn't see How you call me royalty Let's go But in just three days You came and rescued me Yes, you did Have a seat, please. Thank you, guys. Well, happy Easter, everybody. Let's try that again. I'm going to say that and you say it back to me, okay? Happy Easter. Happy Easter. 
Oh, that's great. I'm so glad you guys are here. You all look good. I, I don't want to talk bad about that first service. That was a rough lot in there, i got to tell you that. But, uh, but I, you guys look good, and I dressed up. They, I rented this. I have to have it in by three. They told me not to sweat in it. Uh, but I'm excited to be here with you today, and I hope you're excited today before today's Easter and we are celebrating. Hey, if you are new here today with us, if this is your first time here, we just want to tell you that we are honored and thrilled to have you here today. Can we make some noise for any and all of our visitors here today? Thank you for being here. We, we hope that you have a great, great time here today. Now, guys, as you came through the door today, you should have received a program. And in that program, there's all kinds of stuff. But the most important thing in there is the connection card. And we ask that everybody every week fill out a connection card, whether this is your first time here or whether you've been coming for a long time. It's just our way of connecting with you. And uh, you can write anything you want to on that card, prayer requests. We pray over all of those. Uh, you can check any box that applies to you, things that you're interested in. But this Sunday's connection card is extra special because if you look on the back, there's a spiritual survey on the back. And I'm just asking you to kind of let us know where you're at. You know, we're very, very intentional here about teaching messages out of the Bible that equip you and empower you and help you to deal with the things that you're dealing with in your life. We feel very strongly that the stuff we learn on Sundays, you should be able to apply on Mondays. So it would really help me as pastor if you would kind of tell me, these are the things that I'm interested in. These are the things that my family is dealing with. Or these are the things that my friends are dealing with. Check anything on there. Write something else in that you want to hear about. And I'll put that in my head and look over all those and pray about it as we're trying to figure out what the next series is and where we're going. It'll help me through the whole next year just kind of knowing what you're facing and what you're dealing with. Now, before we dive in today, I want to remind you about a few uh, events uh, that we got coming up. The first one is next uh, Sunday. Uh, it's called Pizza with the Pastors. And if you're new here or new-ish here, I just want to personally invite you to come to Pizza with the Pastors. That event is designed for you. It happens right after church next Sunday, and uh, we'll feed you. And we'll feed your kids. We'll have child care. We'll provide for your kids. They get pizza too. And it's just a way to come and you get to meet me. You get to meet other staff and key leaders here from the church. And we get to meet you. We get to hear your story. It's really relaxed. We're not, it's not an insurance sales seminar or a multi-level marketing thing or anything like that. You just come and hang out and we can kind of get to know each other. I'll tell you a little bit about the history of the church. And I'll answer any questions that you've got. But you are cordially invited to be a part of that. You can either register by, uh, for that by either checking that box on your connection card, or you can go to our app. Everything's always available in our app. Lanier Point, .com, or Lanier Point, search for that in any app store, and you'll find our app. Next thing I want to let you guys know about is uh, growth groups. That starts a week from tomorrow, April 8th. They meet at different times during the week, and uh, it's just a way to connect with other people in the church. We're starting our spring quarter. It only lasts six weeks. It's just six sessions. Uh, but it is a powerful thing, and it's always great to get to know other people. Uh, we get together, and we, you sit in circles instead of rows, and you get to know people. Sometimes people struggle to get plugged in or to know other people. This is the perfect way to do that. This semester or this quarter, uh, we're going to be breaking it up by uh, uh, stages of life. So we've got a group for 20s and 30s. We've got a group for 40s and 50s. We've got a group for 60s plus. Uh, but whatever group you fall in, it, it's going to be an amazing time, and we want you to make sure that you know that that's available to you. If you're interested in that, you can register on the app or, again, on the connection card. It just says, uh, tell me more about growth groups, and we'll reach out to you and help you find the group that works for you. Lastly, uh, we got something coming up in six weeks we like to do around here called Mother's Day. Can we make some noise for Mother's Day? Uh, Mother's Day is, uh, if you know anything about our church, you know we pull out all the stops on Mother's Day. It's a big, big deal here. We're super excited about it. It's just six weeks from today, which is just blowing my mind that it's so nearby. Uh, but uh, we would love for you to be a part of that. I hope you come back next week, obviously, but plan now to be here for Mother's Day. We offer a free professional uh, family portraits for all the families. We have a free gift for each of the moms. We celebrate the moms. We honor the moms. It is just a big, big day, so we hope that you'll be here for that. That is uh, May 12th, uh, Sunday, May 12th. We hope you'll be here for that. Today, of course, we're here for one big reason, and that is to celebrate Easter, to celebrate the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead and that he is alive. And if you talk about Easter a lot, you'll hear a word sometimes that gets thrown out when you talk about Easter, and the word is hallelujah. Sometimes people say hallelujah. But hallelujah is not really a word we use too much in our culture these days. Uh, people use it sort of ironically, like if I'm at Dairy Queen and they have a new blizzard I like, I say hallelujah, okay, kind of thing. 
Uh, and, and people don't even know what the word really means. They don't know what the translation of that, what they're saying when they say hallelujah. They think they're saying, well, that's good or that's great. But what hallelujah literally translates as is praise God, praise the Lord, praise be to the Lord. It is a, it is a word you use to give thanks to God when he's done something amazing, when he's done something powerful, when he's done something incredible. And so when you think about that, when you start to understand Easter, and what Good Friday is all about, what the cross is all about, what the resurrection uh, is all about. When you start to understand all that's included in Easter, you start to realize real quick that hallelujah is a very fitting word for Easter. It's an incredibly fitting word for Easter. In fact, would you say it with me? One, two, three. Everybody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. on his head he knew that he would soon be dead he said did you forget me father did you they nailed him to a wooden cross soon all the world would feel the loss of christ the king before his
the morning sunrise, the women at the tomb, the shaking ground, the stone removed. This is Easter. The flash of lightning, the angel's testimony, the promise of Jesus, the empty grave. This is Easter. A day to hope against all odds. A day to worship our living God. A day to believe in the power of Jesus. A day to celebrate and a day to remember. The curse is broken. The promise is true. The tomb is empty. The King is alive. This is Easter. Well, let's give God another big hand. Can we do that? I don't, I don't know how to follow that song. I'm going to be honest with you. I think we should just have her sing that again and send you home. What do you think about that? If you agree with that, you hurt my feelings deeply. I want you to know that. I'm excited about the day. I hope you are, too. We are here today, obviously, to celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what Easter is all about. Easter has a lot of things attached to it. You know, there's uh, Easter eggs and Easter candy and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, but it, really, at the core of it, the thing that makes Easter really special and most important is that Jesus rose from the dead. Two billion people around the world today are going to celebrate Easter in some fashion. They're going to celebrate it in different ways, but they're all celebrating something that happened 2,000 years ago. Two billion people on the planet celebrating something that happened 2,000 years ago. Why is that? Because Easter is the single greatest day in all of history. Easter is the day that changed everything for everybody. There is no day like Easter because it is the day where everything suddenly changed and a pathway was made for you and for me to be with Jesus and to get to go to heaven. A pathway was made for us to be saved, to be forgiven, to be healed, to be made whole. The resurrection proves a lot of things. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead proves so many things. The biggest thing it proves is that Jesus is who he claimed to be. One time some folks came to Jesus and said, he was doing all these miracles right and left and he was teaching all these amazing things, but they said, we want you to do a big miracle to prove to us that you are the Son of God, that you're from God. And uh, he said, well, I'm going to do one miracle for you and this is the greatest miracle. And he called it the miracle of Jonah. And what he was referring to is this. He said, I'm going to lay my life down and let you crucify me. And I'm going to die. And then three days later, I'm going to pick my life back up. I'm going to come back to life and I'll be alive. And in that moment, you will know that everything I have said to you, everything that I have taught you is true. That is the thing that will show you that it's true. And Jesus did that. He died three days later. He was resurrected. We call that Easter Sunday. He appeared to a couple of ladies, then he appeared to his disciples, and then he appeared to a large group of disciples, and the Bible said he had kept appearing for over a period of 40 days. He kept showing up and appearing all over the place, which been, must have been kind of awkward if you were one of the guys to help crucify him to run into Jesus later downtown. Does that make sense? <laughs> but they kept running into him, and he would come and he would eat fish. The Bible said he would eat fish. <laughs> and the reason why he was eating fish is he wanted to prove to them, I'm not a ghost. Ghosts don't eat fish, by the way. I don't know if you know that, okay? I'm not a vision. I'm not a delusion. He actually cooked a meal for one of them, for some of them one time. He wanted to prove to them I'm real. Even Thomas, the one who doubted, you may have heard the term doubting Thomas, he came up and he said, I won't believe until I stick my fingers in his wounds. And Jesus said, come on and look. And Thomas saw him and inspected him and said, you are the Lord. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. Jesus' resurrection proved that he is who he said he was. But also, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus do more than just prove something. They show us something. They show us very keenly, they show us what's in God's heart for you and for me, what God feels and what God thinks and what God wants to do for you and for me. In fact, look at our first verse here. It's on the screens. It says this. It says, when the centurion 
<coughs> excuse me, the centurion. This was uh, the Roman guard that was there to, to crucify Christ. It said, when the centurion who stood there in front of Christ saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. You need to understand that this centurion had seen a lot of people die. This was his job, was crucifying people. Jesus was not the only person to be crucified in that day. It was used a lot for all kinds of criminals. It was considered the worst way you could die. And they would do it by the side of a road or outside of a city so everybody could watch you die. So you would be scared of the authorities. That was the, that was the whole purpose of it. It was supposed to be the worst torture so that you'd be scared of the Roman authorities and you would obey them. And this centurion had uh, put a lot of people on crosses, and he had watched a lot of people die, and uh, probably his heart had gotten a little jaded about that. It just sort of became mechanical for him. But all of a sudden, when he saw Jesus die, when the Bible says when he saw how he died, it shook that centurion. He saw how Jesus handled himself on the cross. He saw what Jesus did on the cross, and he saw what he heard what Jesus said on the cross, and those things rocked that centurion. He said, I've never seen anybody handle this situation. I've never seen anybody handle this like this man. And it was enough to convince that guy. He says, surely this is the Son of God, because no man would die on a cross like that. The truth is, you and I, we can all look good. We can dress up. Some of you dressed up today. Thank you. We appreciate that. Some of you bathed today. Thank you very much. You know. We can put on a good image, but the reality is you don't really know what's going on inside of somebody until the pressure is on them. Am I right about that? Yes or no? Everybody can act fine when everything's good and nice, but when the pressure is on them, you get to see what's going on inside of them. Have you ever been with somebody and the pressure's on them and you were a little shocked at what came out of them? If you have children, you know what I'm talking about. How about this? Have you ever had the pressure on you and you were shocked and maybe even embarrassed about what came out of you? We're like tubes of toothpaste. We don't know what's going on, but a little squeeze will show us real quick what's inside there. You know, We can see what's going on when the pressure's on. And the pressure was on Jesus. Pressure like nobody had ever experienced. The, the, the most amazing pressure that has ever happened. The, the Bible says that all the sin that has ever been committed or will ever be committed was dumped on Christ in that moment. That all of Satan and all of hell was attacking him at that moment. The Bible says that the Father turned his head from Christ. It was the only time that the Father and the Son were separated because Jesus had taken our sin upon himself and he turned from him. So he felt alone and isolated and attacked. And he's there on the cross. And the way he handles that and the things he say, says are earth-shattering, unbelievable, and incredible. You know, a lot of people are kind of confused about Easter. You may be confused about Easter. I got to tell you that when I was growing up, I didn't, I didn't really know that much about Easter. I didn't really care that much about Easter. I knew that the Easter Bunny brought me candy, and that was about it. I didn't really think much about it. As I got a little older, I started to realize that religious people would get up and go to church on Easter sometimes. I would see that sometimes. And I thought, okay, it's a religious holiday. Something's going on there. You know, I don't know what, but... As long as I was getting my candy, I was cool with it, right? <laughs> but um, I didn't really get that Easter is the celebration of the resurrection of Christ. And I certainly didn't understand why it was so important. And if you had asked me back in that day, and, and if I was not being polite, if I was just really gut level honest with you, I would have said, I, what's the big deal with Easter? Why is it a big deal? Who cares? What difference does it make? Is it just one of many religious holidays that you could celebrate? What's the big deal about Easter? But again, the big deal of Easter is this. Easter proves to us through the resurrection that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And Easter shows us the heart of Jesus. Today I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about why Easter is so important, why the cross is so important. And we're going to be looking at the words that Jesus spoke on the cross. We can't go into all of them because they're so powerful, we could do a whole series on it. But this morning, I just want to look at a few things that Jesus said on the cross and how revolutionary they are and what they show us about him and what they proved on the cross. The first thing that Jesus proved on the cross, he proved that he is ready to forgive you and to forgive me. He is completely ready to forgive you and to forgive me 
of all the things that we've done that we're not proud of. Look at the verse here, it says this. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with Jesus. When they came to the place called the Skull, the little mountain where Jesus was crucified looks like a skull. So it's named Golgotha, which means the skull. It kind of has a skull shape to it. It says, when they came to the place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. This is an amazing thing, that he would pray for the people who were nailing him to the cross. He would pray for all the people that had participated in this thing. And he would ask God to forgive them while they're doing it to him. You need to understand that this crucifixion comes on the tail of a lot of abuse of Jesus. First of all, there was this sham trial where he's accused of all these things he didn't do. And then his best friend betrayed him. And then all his close friends deserted him. And then there were all these false accusations. And then they decided he needed to be whipped with what was called a cat of nine tails, which is uh, strips of leather with cutting uh, edges of rock and glass sewn into it. And they would, whip, they would wrap it around your body and whip it off and it would just lacerate you. And they did that 39 times. And then he was mocked. And then he was spit upon. And then someone struck him on the face with a staff. And then they went and got some thorns, some big long thorns, not just like rose thorns, but long thorns. And they made a cross out of it. And they, they jammed it on his head. And he was bleeding that way. And then they mocked him some more. And then they made him carry his cross as far as he could carry it. And then they get to the place where he's going to be crucified. And they put him on the cross and they put nails in his hands and in his feet. And then they lift him up on that cross with his bloodied back against that cross, with the blood coming out of the thorns and of his crown. And he's, his, the whole weight of his bruised and beaten body is now hanging on those nails. And in that moment, he lifts up on those nails because that's what you have to do to breathe and that's what you have to do to, to speak. And he lifts up on those nails and he says, what's he going to say? There's so many things he could say. What's he going to say? He lifts up on those nails and he says, Father, forgive all these people. Forgive them. Because they don't understand what they're doing. Father, you've got to forgive these people because they don't understand. And that's truly remarkable. I mean, maybe you're like me. If somebody wrongs me in some way, I can forgive them eventually. How many of you are eventual forgivers? Can I see a show of hands here? Eventually. If God helps me, I'll eventually get there. It might take me a decade, but I will get there. Okay? But do you agree with me to forgive somebody while they're attacking you? While they're mocking you, while they're spitting on you, while they're hurting you, while they're accusing you of all kinds of crazy things, to forgive them in that moment, I think we're talking about a kind of forgiveness that humans don't really have. We're talking about divine forgiveness. Do you guys agree with me, yes or no? Yeah. I mean, it is off the chart kind of forgiveness. Human forgiveness is just kind of weak. It's just kind of frail. It's just barely holding together. Without God helping you, forgiving other people is hard, and it's hard to maintain. Years and years ago, I wronged a, a, a guy I knew. I, it was a slight wrong. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's nothing crazy, but I'm not going to tell you what it is because you're nosy, and you need to learn to butt out. That's what I'm telling you. But I wronged him, and I had to go and apologize to him, and I apologized, and we're both Christians, and he forgave me, and it was cool. And we weren't like best friends, so I didn't see him very often, but we had a lot of friends in common, and so I'd bump into him. About every nine months or a year, there'd be a wedding or a get-together or something, and I'd bump into him. And invariably, every time, and I mean for like years and years and years, every time I'd run into him, he'd somehow get me off in a corner, and he'd say, hey, do you remember that time you wronged me? And I'm like, yeah, I remember. He goes, do you remember how I forgave you? And I'm like, yeah, I remember how you forgave me. And it was sort of like, isn't that awesome that I'm so forgiving, you know? And I was like, yeah. And he said, like, you remember how you were horrible, but I was great? Do you remember that? And I was like, yeah, I remember that. I'm going to get some more punch if that's okay with you, you know. And he did it every time. And it got to the point where every time he brought it up, I started like, I don't feel all that forgiven. That every time I see you, you're going to bring it up. And it was sort of like this. It's like, I'm going to forgive you, but I want you to feel bad. I'm going to forgive you, but I want you to hurt. I'm going to forgive you, but I'm never going to let it go. And I'm always going to hang it over your head. And it's always going to be a thing. And if you don't remember it, I'll be sure to remember it. Because it stung when it happened to me, and you ought to have to pay for it. And i got to tell you, that's human forgiveness. 
That's very different than the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. God forgives us very differently than that. I love how God forgives. God forgives so well. He forgives instantly. He forgives completely. He forgives totally, and he forgives freely. That's what divine forgiveness looks like. In fact, look at the next verse to me. It says this. It says, if we freely admit that we have sinned, we find God utterly reliable. Utterly reliable. He forgives our sins and makes us thoroughly what? Thoroughly clean. He says, you got to freely admit it. You have to freely admit, I've blown it, I've made mistakes. I, I, I've sinned. Sin is not a word we want to use anymore. People aren't using the word sin, but let me just say, have you ever made a mistake? Have you ever done somebody wrong? Have you ever done something you regret? Have you ever not done something? You regret not doing something. You didn't go help somebody when you should have, or you didn't stand up for what was right when you could have. Those are sin. How many of you have ever sinned? Let me see a show of hands here. And those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just sinned in the house of God on Easter. Woo! Woo! I'm praying for your soul right now. We've all sinned, and we have to admit it. We can't dance around it. We can't sugarcoat it. We can't say oopsies. We have to just say it's a sin, and it's wrong, and I confess it, and I admit it. You're not fooling God. It's very trans. You might fool other people, but you're not fooling God. Somebody comes in that you don't like, and you're, you're, you're Southern enough to say, well, bless their heart, which means I hate you in, in Southern. And you're acting all nice to them, but in your heart, you've you got bitterness and rage and anger. And Jesus says, if you have anger in heart, it's as if you've murdered somebody. And, you know, many of you are mass murderers, if that's the, you know, the ticket. Because it was so, so, you know, it's like, you're not fooling God. Who are you fooling? Years and years ago, when I was little, I had a little brother. And he had a little spell there where he liked to stick stuff into outlets, electrical outlets. This is before they'd invented seat belts or outlet covers or... I think fire was right around that time they invented that, okay? Um, but, and they told him, no, don't do it. But he just, we would find stuff to stick in the outlets, you know. And one day I remember I was down laying on the ground watching television, as you did back in the day. We had a big console TV, and I remember laying on it. And he was in the other room, and he had found a screwdriver and a paper clip. And he decided to do some tests, I guess. And I, I kid you not, um, the whole power, I heard a whap from the other room. And the whole power in the house went, Whoo! like that. Everything, everything just dipped for a second. The lights and everything. And my mother called out to him and said, what are you doing? And he said, nothing. <laughs> and he came walking out, and I kid you not, we, we both had very fine blonde hair at the time. There was all this hair standing up on his head. <laughs> just standing up. He said, nothing. And in there on the wall was a black mark and a screwdriver and a paper clip. God knows how that happened there. He had nothing to do with that. You know. And it was just so apparent to all of us uh, I don't know that, you know, you were doing nothing. <laughs> what were you doing? It's the same thing with God. We're like, God, I ain't doing nothing. It's all good. And God's like, I don't know about that. Your hair's standing up, my friend. <laughs> Your hair's standing up. God knows. He knows, and he still loves you. He knows everything. The stuff you're most embarrassed about. The stuff that you'd never tell anybody. The stuff that lurks deep in there. He knows. He knows, and he loves you. He knows, and he loves you, and he says, I want to forgive you. The verse here is incredible to me. It says, if we freely admit it, that's our part. We have to confess it. We can't pretend. We can't dance around it. But he says, if we freely admit it, we can rely on him. He is utterly reliable to forgive us. Some people, sometimes when people talk to me, they're like, well, I asked God to forgive me, but it was such a horrible thing, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And, and they, they can't believe that God would forgive them of something that maybe they're really embarrassed about. I get it, because what we're doing is we're judging it the way a human would judge it. I don't think a human could forgive me, so I don't think God could forgive me. But we've already established here that divine forgiveness is far above human forgiveness. And the crazy great news in the Bible is, no matter what you've done, there is forgiveness available to you through Jesus Christ. And if you will admit it, just freely admit it, you can count on him. He is utterly reliable to thoroughly cleanse you and give you a second chance and a fresh start. Now, I know some of you are saying, but Pastor Tony, you don't know what I've done. You have no idea what I've done. You have no idea the guilt 
or the shame or the regret or the remorse, remorse that I carry with me in my heart. And you're right, I don't. I don't know all of you. I certainly don't know all of you know, to know you well enough to know what's really going on in your heart. But here's what I do know. I don't know what you've done, but I know what Jesus did on the cross. I know that that blood is powerful enough to cleanse every sin, to cleanse every mistake. The blood of Jesus Christ was so powerful, it can forgive us all and can forgive all. Let everybody say amen. All we have to do is to confess it and he'll forgive it. That's the first thing that he proved on the cross. The second thing he proved on the cross is that he's eager to embrace you. And he's eager to embrace me. He's eager to embrace us. Look at the story here. It says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man has done, hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, and get a load of this. Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me where? You will be with me in paradise. This story always stops me cold when I read it because this, there's two thieves here, two criminals and when we say criminals, we believe these men were insurrectionists. We believe they were murderers. These were not like shoplifters with petty crimes. These men had done some pretty horrible things. And they've been sentenced to death, and they just so happen to be sentenced to death on the same day that Jesus is sentenced to death by crucifixion. And they all three are crucified at the same time. And one of them is angry. And he's still spitting at God and cursing God. And he's mocking Jesus. Even though he's dying. Even though he knows I've made so many mistakes and I so need help. But I don't care. I don't care. I hate it all and I'm mad and I'm mad at everything. And he's still spitting at God. Even in his last moments. The other one, though, has some sense. <laughs> and he says... He rebukes his buddy. He goes, look, we've both done horrible things. We deserve to die. But this man, he does not deserve to die. Why would you mock this man while you're dying? It's dumb. And then he says to Jesus, from one cross to the other, he says, Lord, will you remember me when you enter your kingdom? you got to realize that he was asking the Lord to forgive him and to accept him and to receive him. But what was he offering Jesus? He had nothing to offer Jesus. He was never going to sing a worship song. He was never going to attend a church service. He was never going to help anybody else. He was never going to serve at a church. He was never going to give anything to anybody. The only thing he could offer to Jesus were the last few minutes the last few breaths of a wicked and wasted life. And the remarkable thing is, Jesus said, surely I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. He said, Jesus, all I've got to give you is me. And it's not good. I've done a lot of things. I deserve to die. But could you, out of your grace, see it in your heart to remember me and receive me in your kingdom? And Jesus said, yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. It's a remarkable thing. you got to realize, though, that the thief... There were a lot of things the thief didn't do that are really great. First off, he didn't rationalize. He didn't say, Jesus, you know, I'm bad, but I'm not as bad as the guy on the other cross on the other side of you over there. He's spitting at you. You know, I, I think you need to save me because I'm so much better than some of the wicked people around. A lot of times when I ask people why God should let them into heaven, when you have that discussion, they don't want to admit that they've ever done anything wrong. And they're like, well, I'm not as bad as Hitler. I get that a lot. I was like, well, great. When you get to heaven, just say, hey, 
I'm not as bad as Hitler. I mean, what a horrible way to view yourself. But really what it is, is it's like I'm weighing myself on a scale, and I know there are worse people out there than me. What you don't realize is that we're all in this boat. We're all sinners. We all need help. Not one of us is getting in. The Bible says that our righteousness, our attempts to be great and good, that it's like filthy rags before God. It just doesn't add up. You can't dig your way out of this hole, and it doesn't matter how deep the next guy's hole is. You're still in a hole. And so we don't rationalize. We don't compare. We don't put on airs. We don't pretend that we're something that we aren't. Sometimes when people, well, when people say they want to get baptized, we just ask them, well, why do you want to get baptized? We, we interview them and just want to make sure they understand baptism. We interview adults and kids. Adults are funny because they come in and they want to use all this religious language and try to impress or something. I don't know what it is. And so they'll say, well, you know, God loves those who help themselves. And, you know, I, they just say weird things, you know. And then when you talk to a kid, they're like, literally, this is what a kid will say. Like, if they haven't been coached, if they've been coached by their parents, they start saying it sound like a parent. But the kid will say, well, I just love Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus. And he says, I ought to be baptized. <laughs> and you know what? They're right. They get it. The adults want to go off on all this thing and all this stuff. And it's just like, Jesus died for me. I love Jesus. He wants me to be baptized. That's what I'm doing. So if you do want to get baptized, now you know what to respond to on the questionnaire, okay? <laughs> he doesn't try to con God either. He doesn't try to do this thing where he's trying to manipulate God and all this kind of business. Years ago, I worked in a copy room at a library at a university. And uh, the university students, the college students would always come in. And, you know, college students are notoriously poor, but they would always come in needing copies but they would say they didn't have any money, and they would always, well, they wouldn't say any money. What they did come in is that machine broke, and this thing didn't work, and everybody, every machine broke for everybody, and they, were, they needed free copies. They're always trying to con free copies out of me, and I abused my authority and said, no, I like being in that position. Now, I got, you get jaded after a while. Everybody coming to you, everybody trying to con you, everybody always trying to con you to get free stuff from you. It's just annoying after a while, you know. But one day, this guy came in, and he looked rough. He looked like he'd been, I don't know, he just looked rough. He did not look like a star student, I will tell you that. And he came in, and he was like, he was like one of these guys, like, oh, you know. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about? Guys talk like that? Some of you do. Um, some of you hang out in better circles, I'll be honest with you, you know. But he's like, dude, he's like, dude, he's like, I got to get copies of this thing. And he's like, dude, I ain't got no money. And he's like, dude, if I don't get copies of this thing, he's like, I'm going to fail. Dude, I, you know, whatever. And he just laid it all out. And I said, okay, give it here. And I copied the whole thing for him. And I said, here. And the reason why I did it was because I'm a great person. No, 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 no. <laughs> the reason why I did it was he was honest with me. If he'd come in and say, oh, I've copied him, and then the dog ran off with him, and I need more, you know, I just, oh. But just to, just to be honest with, just, just guys with God, just be honest with him. Because, again, who are you fooling, Right? Don't bribe or barter God. You just bribe or barter God. You just trust the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I and mean, let's be all let's all be real here. We're all like that thief on the cross. We've all got, done things we regret. We've all done things that we need Him to forgive. We're all in a place where we're just saying, Jesus, out of Your mercy, will You receive me? Some people think that the way it works is well. Um, when you die, it, you know you you do good things and you also do bad things. And your hope is that you do one more good thing than bad thing when you die. And Jesus sees you and goes, way to go. You made it in by one thing. Awesome. Whew, we were worried, man. It was neck and neck there at the end. But you remember how you didn't run over that little old lady on your way? That saved you, man. <laughs> if you'd hit her, no, boom, zoo, you're done. What the Bible says is that we're in such a hopeless situation that there's no way of getting out of it. Except Jesus comes and rescues us. And you can try as hard as you want, but it's like saying, like all of us saying, we're going to swim from Savannah to China. Well, none of us are going to make it. Some of you might make it further than others. I won't make it 10 feet before I give up. But it's an impossible task. You are not going to swim from here to China. And the Bible says, like, when you try to build your own form of righteousness, here are my good works and everything, you're trying to build this, like, ladder to heaven, and it will never be tall enough. 
But what the Bible says is that God understood our miserable position, and He says, I've got a solution. You are not going to work your way up to me. I'm going to come down to earth in the flesh. I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to pay for those sins, and I'm going to take you with me back to heaven. Jesus is your rescuer. He is your savior. He is the one that has come to save you from those things that beset you. With him there is always hope. Somebody say amen. There is hope. The hope isn't in me or my righteousness or my abilities or how good natured I am or if I can undo stuff. My hope is in Jesus Christ. My hope is in what he did on that cross. That is our hope. What does this guy say? He just says, remember me. If I were to translate that little prayer into a, into a modern prayer, it would be this. Help me. People think that prayers need to be poems or they need to be these big things they recite. Sometimes the most powerful prayer that you can pray is a help me prayer. How many of you ever prayed a help me prayer? Let me see a show of hands. Those are powerful prayers. That thief, all he could say was, Jesus, help me. I have nothing to give you. Would you help me? And Jesus said, sure. Certainly, surely, today, today, before this day is over, you will be with me in paradise. Check out this amazing promise from the Bible. The next verse, it says this. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Will be saved. The first word there is anyone. Does that include you? Yes or no? Yeah. Does it include me? That was a little weak. I got to be honest with you. Okay. (laughs) It includes everybody. He wants to receive you. He's not looking for a reason to reject you. He's looking for a reason. He's looking for opportunities to embrace you. When my kids were little, I used to do this thing with them where I'd come up and I'd say, I'm going to get you. And they go, hee, 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 hee. That lasted about a week. I want you to know about that. But I, I would do that, and I would chase them around the house, and then I would snatch them up, and I would hug them as hard as I could hug them. And if I told you this, if I said, God is out to get you, how would you hear that? Probably not in a positive way, right? If somebody just walked by you and said, God's out to get you, you'd be like, oh, what? (laughs) What are you talking about? But he is out to get you, just like I was out to go and scoop up my children and hug them and love on them. He is the father that is looking to hug you, to embrace you, to be there with you, to have a relationship with you. There's a famous story that Jesus taught in the Bible called the prodigal son. The prodigal runs away and he wastes his life and he does all these horrible things. And then the next time we see his father, it just tells us this. The father was looking. He was scanning the horizon for the day that his son might come home. And your heavenly father is just looking for that day where you turn to him and come to him. He's looking for that day where you receive him. He's looking for that day where you say, God, I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of running from you. I'm tired of trying to do this life on my own. I'm tired of trying to build my own righteousness. I'm going to give myself. He's just looking for you to turn around. And he is out to get you, man. He has been pinging you. He's been knocking on your heart. He's been seeking out you, seeking you out. Your whole life, whether you know it or not, you may have felt very alone, but you've never been alone because he's always been trying to get your attention. And maybe, maybe, maybe he brought you here today on Easter Sunday in Buford of all places to get your attention long enough just to say this to you. I love you. I forgive you. I'm not angry at you. I'm not trying to punish you. I'm not trying to get you. I'm just trying to get your attention so that you could have a relationship with me. That's really what Easter is all about. Jesus one time had a big, big thing. He stood up, and the Bible says he said in a loud voice, so he like yelled it. He stood up one time and he said, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And then later in that same thing, he said, I will give you rest for your souls. Imagine a person standing up and saying, if you're weary, any of them, if you're weary, if you're tired, if you're burdened, burdened, you're just tired of carrying all this stuff around. You're carrying around guilt and shame and remorse and worry and fear. You're just worn out from all the stuff that's been strapped to you. you know? He says, if you're tired and weary, 
here's what you do. Don't go away. He doesn't say, go away because I don't want you to bother me. He says, come to me, all of you. If you're tired and you're weary, come to me, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest for your souls. And isn't that what you really want out of life more than anything? I mean, if you boil it down, you want rest for your soul. You want peace. You want, you want to be able to go to sleep in peace and wake up in peace and go through this life in peace. And he offers that. Jesus offers that to anyone. Come, come, all of you, come. If you're burdened and weary, and I will give you rest for your soul. That brings us to the third thing that Jesus proved on the cross. He proved on the cross without a shadow of a doubt that he's prepared to liberate you and liberate me. Look at the verse here. It says this, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and released his spirit. Now, how many of you know that starting big projects is easy sometimes? Can I see a show of hands? Starting them. How many of you have some uh, projects you've started that you haven't quite finished? They've been hanging around about 10, 15 years. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You, anybody got a project at their house that mocks them? You're walking around it now. You know what I'm saying? Try not to look at it. Projects. It's easy to start things. Sometimes it's hard to start, but it's always easier to start things than it is to finish things well. And Jesus was a finisher. He knew how to finish things well. And he gets up there and he says this word. It's one word. We translate it into three words. He says, it is finished. But the word he was using was the word tetelestai. Tetelestai. On the cross, he pulls up on his nails. He pulls up, he takes his breath, and he says, tetelestai. And everybody in that crowd would have known the significance of that word. They would have known the depth of that word, the meaning of that word. It was used in their culture all over the place. A servant, when a master had asked him to do something, when a servant had finished the task, they would say, Tetelestai, I finished the task you gave me, master. And a judge, when a judge had decided, uh, we've served justice here, this case is closed, justice has been served, he would say, Tetelestai, it is finished, it's closed, it's complete. An accountant when they were marking out a debt, when a debt had been paid off in full and the debt was no longer there, when the debt had been paid off, they would write down, Tetelestai. An artist working on a masterpiece, some form of art, when they got done, when they'd done the last little stroke to it, they'd step back and they'd look at it and they would say, Ah, Tetelestai, it's complete. It's done. It's finished, this work of art. And a priest in that day, When he had finished giving the perfect offering, he would step back, offering to the Lord, and he would say, Tetelestai, it is finished. And Jesus on the cross that day was saying Tetelestai in all kinds of ways. He was saying, Father, I've completed the task you've given me, Tetelestai. He was saying, Lord, justice has been served. I've taken the sin of humanity and I've paid the cost of justice. I've paid for every wrong on this cross with my blood so that they could be free. Tetelestai. He said, Lord, there was this huge debt that all the people owed and they were so hopelessly in debt they could never get out of debt. But I have paid that debt by my righteous death on the cross. Tetelestai. Like an artist, he said, Father, I've completed this life that you've given me. I've put everything I have into it. It is now the completed masterpiece that you've called me to create. To tell us that. And then lastly, <laughs> he says, Lord, the great offering, the single great offering, the greatest offering that will ever be offered me, has now been offered for you on the cross. The offering has been presented to you. To tell us that. He did all that on that cross that day. He fulfilled all the righteous requirements. Jesus once said something very interesting about his power and ability in our lives. Look at the next verse to me. It says this. So if the Son sets you free, you will be absolutely what? Absolutely free. Another translation says, if the Son sets you free, you are really and unquestionably free. (laughs) So the question is, free from what? If Jesus is setting you free, what is he setting you free from? Well, lots of things. We could spend all day talking about all the things that Jesus came to set you free from. But one of the biggest ones is fear. People live with a lot of fear. Fear of the future, fear of being alone, fear of the unknown, fear of what's around the corner, fear of not having the strength to make it through 
the things they're going through. And the next verse talks about another big fear that people have that Jesus wants to answer. Look at this next verse. It says this. Jesus became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. I don't think that anybody likes going to a funeral. I've been to more than my fair share as a pastor. I've been to more than my fair share of funerals. Funerals are hard. They're hard things. And nobody wants to be there. One time a man had a loved one pass away and he had been to our church a few times and he thought of me as funny. I know you don't, but he thought of me that way. And he said, I really want you to be funny at this funeral. And I said, no. I said, you don't want that. And he was like, no, I really want you to be funny at the funeral. I said, I can't be funny at the funeral. He goes, I really want you to be funny at the funeral. And so I say, I'm the guy that puts the fun in funerals. That's what I say. <laughs> I had to explain to him. I said, look, well, first of all, let me say this. If somebody wants to get up and share a story of the person that's passed on, and it's a humorous story, I think that's wonderful. I think laughter at a funeral is a powerful thing. But I don't think you want the pastor coming in saying, you know, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the funeral. <laughs> I said, you know, it's not, it's not that. That is not the purpose of that thing. And even people say we want it to be a celebration of life. I get that. But you, it, it shouldn't be a joke fest, you know. And it's hard to come in and try because there's two things going on. First of all, people are sad because someone they care about has passed on. And the Bible says there's a time to grieve, and it's, it's a good thing to grieve. You don't have to act happy. You, you can grieve and still celebrate the life. You know, it's okay. But really also something, i got to tell you, I've been to a lot of funerals, and there are a lot of people that don't know Christ or don't have a real relationship with him. And as you talk to them, you realize they are scared. They are scared to death of death. And they don't want to be near death. They don't want to be even talking about death. It's, 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 to them, it's more than just the person that died. They may make themselves come to show respect, but they just want to get out of there as soon as possible because it makes them think about something that they don't want to think about. Because if they think about it, they're going to get terrified because they don't know if anything's going to happen or they don't know what's going to happen, but death scares them. And everybody's like that unless Jesus comes into their lives. I'll confess to you that I'm no longer scared of death. It doesn't scare me. Now, let me quickly say, I don't want to die a painful death. Can I, somebody say amen? <laughs> like I, <you> know, <laughs> my ideal death is that everybody's around me, all my loved ones, and I get to say goodbye to them, and then they bring me a huge blizzard, and I eat that. <laughs> and then I have one of those sugar coma naps, and I just wake up in heaven. That's the way I view it. You know, I don't want to die in some tragic accident or something. You know, I, I, I get that. I get that. I get that. Nobody wants to die that way. But you don't have to live scared of death. Here's something that I know. Everybody in this room is going to die one day. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next time. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but the mortality rate for humans is hovering right about 100%. Did you guys know that? It's, it's so crazy that the, one of the things that we know is going to happen is the thing we don't want to think about. And we don't want to talk about it. And Jesus says, you don't have to live your life in fear. You don't have to be afraid now. You don't have to be afraid of what's coming. You don't have to be afraid of what happens the day you die. You don't have to be afraid of any of that because I have come to rescue you. I have come to save you. I am your Savior. Isn't that a powerful, redeeming thing? Set you free from that. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I'm going to leave you soon. I'm going to go up to heaven. He goes, but don't let your hearts be troubled. He goes, one, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. That's his spirit that will be among us, that will help us and comfort us, and you can have a peace from God that comes even in the middle of hard times. But he says, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back and get you, and I'm going to take you there. The word there, place, literally is the word for mansion. Jesus said, I'm going to heaven, and I'm going to prepare a mansion for you individually. My mansion is going to look a lot like a frozen yogurt shop. I'm going to tell you that right now. Okay? But he said, 
I'm preparing a place for you because you need to know that there's something beyond this grave and you need to know that when you die, I'll be right there with you just like I was the day before you died and I'll take you straight to your mansion and you'll be with me in heaven. And you don't have to be worried about that. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Uh, I once had the opportunity, the great opportunity to go to Israel, to go to the Holy Land. And I got to the, the big payoff when you go to the Holy Land is you get to go see the tomb of Jesus. And there's actually two places. Nobody's sure which one's it. One of them is um, really kind of tacky. There's a Bucky's beside it. I don't, I don't think that's the one. I mean, you can't get cool drinks there, but it's not the one. And then there's the other one. Um, and the other one is in this garden, and it's underneath a hill that looks like a skull. They think that's where Jesus was crucified. And it is a powerful thing to step into both of those tombs. Uh, but I got news for you. You don't have to go. You don't have to see it. You can live a great life and never be there because, spoiler alert, they're both empty. There's nothing there. You can say, well, something cool happened here, but there are no bones or no remnants. You know, you can go to the, the burial spots of all kinds of famous people around the world, but you don't have to do that for Jesus because he's alive. He's, alive. he's the only guy that ever borrowed a tomb. It's like if I go over to the, the funeral home and say, I need a casket, somebody died, but they're only going to use it for three days. What's your cost on, like, can I return it? Well, why do you need a casket for three days? He's coming back. He's coming back. They think you're insane. The disciples were shocked when Jesus came back. They were shocked. But they saw him. Even Thomas, the one who doubted, saw him and said, Lord, this is amazing. This is incredible. You're alive. Jesus is alive. That's why we celebrate Easter. He's alive. He's as alive today as he was uh, uh, 2,000 years ago. He's more alive than anybody in this room. He is alive. Let everybody say amen. amen. You know, the last words on the cross from Jesus were, it is finished, but it wasn't I am finished. He's still working. He's still moving. He wasn't saying, I'm done. He's saying, the assignment's done. The work is done. The sacrifice has been given. That's what he was saying. But he wasn't saying, I'm tired and I'm done. He said, I'm just getting started in doing everything that I'm going to do. Guys, before we close here today, I want to ask you to help me with something. Would you get out your connection cards? Get them out again for me, everybody. Just wave them at me when you got them, and I'll know that you've got them out. But everybody get the connection card out. Everybody, please, go ahead and get it out and get it in your hand. Wave it at me. I see a few people waving, okay? A few more. Get it out. Go ahead and get it out. So here's the deal with these cards. On the very back, I told you there was a survey on the back, but at the bottom, there's an A, B, C, D survey at the bottom. Those little check boxes. You see them? In a second, I'm going to ask you to mark one of those boxes. And I want you to help me. I want to do a spiritual survey of where you're at. You know, it's good to stop sometimes and think to yourself, where am I at? Where am I at spiritually? And I want to do that here today. And each of those boxes represents one category you can be in. And listen to me, everybody's in one of these categories. Everybody's in one of these categories. So let me tell you what they are. Don't mark them yet, but let me tell you what they are. The first one is A, and A stands for already. Jesus is already my Lord. I've given my life to Christ I have a relationship with him. I'm not perfect, but he loves me, and I'm doing my best to walk with him. If that's you, you can just mark A. B stands for I'm beginning. I want to begin a relationship with Jesus today. I want to, I'm tired of running from him. I'm tired of neglecting him. I'm tired of not allowing him to love me or embrace me or forgive me. I'm tired of trying to have my own righteousness. I instead, I'm coming to Christ today. I want to begin a relationship with him. Now, some of you, you had a relationship with Jesus, and at some point you wandered off. Maybe today's the day where you say, B for you means I'm beginning that relationship again. But that's B. C is I want to consider it. I want to consider it. I'm considering it all. You know what? If that's you, I want you to know I love you, and I'm so happy you're here. When I first gave my life to Christ, I didn't understand all of it, and it took me a long time to really consider all of it. And we've always wanted this church to be a place where it's real safe, to come and kick the tires and find out what Christianity is about and consider it. 
I'll tell you something, when you consider God, and I don't mean just kicking the can and not thinking about it again, but when you really consider God, he will show himself to you in powerful ways. When doubting Thomas came to Jesus and said, I won't believe unless I see your hands and your feet, Jesus said, all right, come on. He wasn't scared of Thomas inspecting him. There's this wonderful verse in the Bible where God says, come let us reason together. God says, let's talk it out. You'll be amazed what God will show you and do for you if you'll talk it out. And that brings us to D. D is you saying, I don't ever intend to make this decision. You're just saying, I'm I'm not interested. And I know there's some people in here, every time we've done this, we haven't done it in many years, but every time we've done it, we've had people mark D. And I want you to know something. I love you. And God loves you. And it's It scares me that you mark D, but I appreciate you telling me. I want you to be honest. I don't want you just to be polite. Just say, I'm a D. But here's what's going to happen. Here's what you need to know. If you mark D, whether you want me to or not, I'm going to pray for you. And here's what I know. I've seen a lot of D people become B people over time. A lot of D people become B people. And um, sometimes they have to go through a lot before they realize stuff. And I hope you don't have to go through anything. But I want you just to be honest. All right, so just now, just a second. Take a second, think about where you are, and mark it on that card. And when you do, bow your head, and I'll know you're ready to pray. And we'll have a word of prayer. So if that's you, wherever you're at, an A person, B, C, or D, mark it on the card for me, please. And bow your head. Father, we thank you for Easter. We thank you that your son came and died on a cross for all of us, and death couldn't hold him, and he was resurrected on the third day. We thank you, Lord, for what it proves. It proves that it's all true. And Lord, we thank you for what it shows us about your heart, that you're loving, you're forgiving, you're gracious, you're kind, that you're out to get us in the best way possible, that You're waiting to embrace us, that you care for us, that you don't want us to go through this life burdened and shackled, weighed down with fears and worries and regrets and remorse and pain and shame and scared to death of death. We thank you, Lord, that the Scripture teaches us that because of what Jesus did, death has no sting anymore. It exists, but for the believer... There's no pain to it. To die is to simply to graduate and go and be with you. And we thank you for that today. Lord. We thank you that death could not hold our Savior. And we thank you, Lord, that you came not to rebuke us, but to love us. And not to show us that, we, you know, that we're hopeless, but to save us. We thank you that you're a saving God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our Savior. And with nobody looking around, If you've never given your life to Christ, you want to rededicate your life to Christ, wherever you're at on that, it would be my honor to lead you in a simple prayer. Just like we learned about the thief today, it's not about having some kind of poem or knowing all this theology. It's really just about praying a simple prayer. So if you're ready, just pray this prayer with me in your heart. It's just between you and him right now, but in your heart. Say, Jesus, I give my life to you today. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for paying the penalty of everything I've ever done wrong so that I could have a fresh start, a clean slate, and a new beginning. I say you're my Lord, my boss, my king, my savior, my coach. You're in charge of me. I give my very self to you today. Thank you for making me a Christian on this Easter Sunday. Thank you for changing me. Help me to walk this out. I'll walk with you all the days of this life and into the next. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Let everybody please say amen. 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 Now, if you prayed that prayer with me to give your life to Christ or to rededicate your life to Christ, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when one person prays a prayer like that. We probably have many decisions in here like that today. Can we join with heaven and make some great noise? Come on, give it up. Give it up. Now, when you pray a prayer like that, it's important you tell somebody that understands the significance of it. We would love it if you told us. Uh, If you'll just mark on your connection card on the front there, it says, I gave my life to Christ or I rededicated my life to Christ. We want to pray for you and rejoice with you, and we want to send you some stuff in the mail to help you get started on this great new journey with Christ on the right foot. I want you to know as pastor, I'm really, really proud of you. Way to go. Praise God. Praise God. All right, guys, now's our time of giving. If you're new here, 
please do not feel obligated to give anything. We don't want you to give anything. The only thing that we ask is when that offering basket comes by, you put that connection card uh, in there uh, as it comes by. We hope this whole service has been a gift to you. If you want to, you can take your connection card out to the guest services desk in the lobby, and they have a free gift for you. If you want to go out there today, I think it's a box of kittens and puppies. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, but you can go out there and get that. We would love to give you that. But either way, uh, thank you for being here today. We hope that you're blessed. Are you glad you came to church on Easter Sunday, folks? Give God a hand. Isn't God amazing? Isn't he wonderful? Give him another hand. Everybody say amen. All right, let's all stand, please. We're going to sing one last song to the Lord. Now listen, we're going to sing the song Risen that we sang at the start of the service. This is not a song where you just sing it. We're talking about Jesus being risen. So I need you to get animated. I need you to put your hands together. I need you to clap. If we were at the club, you'd be all over this song, okay? You'd be all over. I don't need all your club moves, but just a few, okay? But let's celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ is risen. Will you say hallelujah? hallelujah. Let me say it once. Will you say hallelujah with me one more time? One, two, three. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's sing, church. Let's sing.